um, been known her uh, for a couple years prior to that. Uh, and when I got to see Robin's art, and especially the sons, uh, I began to think, I don't know if we, if we are, if our art and creative actions are a display of who we are, then, then Robin figured out who she was uh, as a ray of light and as a person filled with sunshine and joy and happiness. Um, and she was that, that way her entire life, uh, even in the worst days of her life. Uh, she still shined through beauty. And so it makes it extremely special for me to stand here and look out at all of you to see the beauty on each of every one of your faces. Because I know that Robin had a special part in each of your lives. And you being here today to celebrate and remember her life uh, is a special, beautiful thing. We live in a world that doesn't like talking about things like death and darkness. But it's important for us to be able to have this opportunity to share um, just how much, and I believe this, that God has blessed us with one another how God has blessed us to be able to create with art and music, how we're able to create relationships and friendships. It's part of what God has done for us and commanded us uh, when he put us here in this place. So it is beautiful to see you all here today. And I thank you all on behalf of Ted and Robin's family for the love and the thoughts, the prayers, the the gifts, the kind words, the memories, the stories. Thank you for all of those things because it's those things that keeps Robin's memory alive and also it keeps us alive a bit more each and every day as well. Before we get started, I do want to say a prayer, open this time in prayer, and then I believe I'll hand it off to the next. So will you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Mighty God, we do thank you for this day that you have given us. Each day that you give, give us is a day that you have made. Your scriptures uh, point us in the direction that we should rejoice and be glad in it. Today is a day that we get to rejoice and celebrate the life of our friend Robin for the gifts that you gave us through her. Uh, for her wisdom, for her humor, for her love, her patience, uh, all of the, th the gifts that she had, Lord. We thank you for those. And we thank you, Lord, for how you have made each and every one of us a little bit better person because of her. God, I pray that as uh, we are here today, that the stories and the, the memories that are shared, Lord, that these would be uh, honoring to you and be a nourishment to each and every one of us so that, Lord, we may know that as we go forward in the days ahead, um, that we are not alone, that you are with us and that you do love us. Lord, be with us, guide us and help us for we do love you and thank you and ask all this in Jesus name. Amen. Sorry about the microphone. That was that was not a planned part of the program, by the way. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I was friends with uh, Robin for many, many years, and knowing her as well as I know her, um, she would not want this to be a sad occasion. So our job is to make this not a sad occasion. <laughs> um, we are the uh, old-fashioned rhythm method. I will give you a minute to think about that. <laughs> Uh, we have Chuck King is master of trumpet, and um, we have Carlos Pino who's master of banjo and guitar. And um, my name's Tom Dameron, and I uh, I just try to keep up with them. So we're going to do the first tune. We'll give you an example of what we're trying to to do. Um, it's out of the ninth, all these songs are out of the 1920s, but they reflect back on what kind of personality she had. When she would come in a room, you know, light, lights would come on. Uh, <laughs> but um, 
first tune is when my sugar walks down the street, all the birdies go tweet, tweet, tweet. <laughs> so there. Could she, could she go? Has anybody seen my cat? Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Has anybody seen, one more time, anybody seen my cat? Oh, yes, all right.
till you're walking down the street I ask you very confidentially Ain't she sweet? Ain't she nice? I look her over once or twice Did do, did did I better Ain't she sweet? Cast an eye in her direction Oh me, oh my Now that's perfection Ain't she sweet? I did be boodle it up. Now, if the spirit moves you, I think it would be very appropriate for you to sing along on this one. All right.
Let's hear the choir for Robin and escape. I go marching. Thank you. 
Give me a minute. So, <clears throat> watching the slides go by. By the way, <clears throat> I have to say this because um, my daughter got married in 2019. And I decided I was going to sing a song to her. It was awful. <laughs> because I did exactly what I'm about to do up here. I got up and just started bawling. <laughs> The second song they did today was um, uh, Eyes of Blue, Five Foot Two, Eyes of Blue. This is one of my dad's favorite songs to sing. And he was singing that to Robin all the time because she was five foot two. <laughs> and she had very blue eyes, as you can see from the picture on the front here. Um, I have a thousand stories I could tell of my sister, and most of them are good. Uh, but what really amazes me is to see all the people in this room from so many different places, so many different times of her life, and how she affected all of you. So I'm only going to say, <clears throat> I, by the way, I, I work in professional radio. Can you tell? <laughs> <coughs> I'm only going to say that the stories that you all have of Robin are the stories that you'll carry out of here. And the ones you hear from other people will just add to what you already know. <sighs> to what you already know about such a wonderful person. There was nobody like my sister. From the time she protected me from my brother. <laughs> to the time that she dre helped dress me up for Halloween, two years to the time where when I was in, I don't know, seventh or eighth grade and I was playing with my GI Joes outside in South Carolina that she brought her Barbies out to join because I didn't have enough. <laughs> and actually, to tell you the truth, they weren't her Barbies, they were Jennifer's Barbies. <laughs> that way, if they got blown up, I think it didn't affect her. Um, my sister affected so many people in so many ways. And when she was about to turn 50 and she sent me a picture of Sam Elliott, that she was about to marry. <laughs> I thought, wow, she has really stretched out a lot. She's like reaching out to people I didn't even know she knew. <laughs> but those last years from, the, from age, as she put the quote in here at age 49, from 49 on were the most amazing years of her life. And how many people would say that you knew Robin before, say, graduation from high school? How many people knew her graduation before high school? Okay. How many of anybody here met her while she was in college, either at Montevallo or at Auburn? Okay. <laughs> yeah, he does. Um,
So, um, and how many, how many met her when she lived here in Homewood? Okay. And how many met her after she moved to uh, the coast, down to Fairhope? Yeah. So it's like this, just this mix. Every place she went, she just dragged people along with her. And there's probably not a person in the world that I could think of, unless maybe it's somebody at the DMV, that ever got annoyed with Robin. <laughs> She's, she was an amazing person. She was a loving person. Seeing her with pictures of my dad, my dad would be so proud of her. She was basically a clone of my dad. <laughs> and all the things that I would like to say that I could say about me and my dad, she had. And I didn't. I tried. <laughs> but just, I, I can't even imagine a world without her, and yet it's been months and months without her. But I know that everyone here has her with her. And everyone's going to carry her out of this door with them. And all the faces that I see here, we all have something in common. And it's something that we will never get rid of, and that's the love of Robin. So, I was asked to be the lead here to bring people up to speak. I think I can do that now. Um, I'd actually like to start for a moment. My mother has asked if she could tell a story about Robin. And so I was going to let her do that. She's sitting right here in the flannel shirt looking like a lumberjack. <laughs> If you'd like to, you, you want to stand up and, stand up. yeah, just stand up there. Okay. It's a short story. So I'm going to kind of follow the order in here. Um, I'd actually, uh, um, uh, Theo, you have the, the recording ready, okay. We had one person who couldn't meet here, and I, it says here that I'm going to read it. Thank goodness I'm not going to have to read. Um, so Theo has that on tape, and he'll play that for us in a minute. Um, so Naomi? Oh, there you are. Thanks. You're a tough act to follow. <laughs> Hello, I'm Naomi, one of three sisters Robin called her Ted daughters after she married our dad. Nearly one year ago today, we got to treasure one of Robin's good days. She was well enough to join us for a day of family and art. We were visiting from Colorado, myself and our youngest daughter Ruth and Ruth's then five-month-old baby Shoshana. That sunny Saturday, was ideal for our first time seeing my dad's wonderful installation in Columbiana. We also got to indent the clay mold my dad would use to make a bronze of Shoshana's tiny feet and hands. That practically perfect day was capped off by a magical moment seeing Robin hold Shoshana in her lap. Robin looked so content, serene, and free of pain. Watching Robin and Shoshi gaze at each other is one of my favorite ways to think of Robin. Recently, I was looking out my kitchen window at my bird feeders and my heated water bowls, and there was a gathering of red-breasted robins sipping and surrounding the water. I'd never seen this many robins at once. Here was an entire robin festival at my water bowls. <laughs> And I told my family that our Robin must have sent them. Not long after I insisted that, my husband Joe found an article about how British people have a common saying, when Robins appear, loved ones are near. Perhaps that sounds like coincidence or folklore, but I'm convinced the bird party was sent to comfort us from heaven. Robin has gifted us so much beautiful art full of whimsical charm and lively color. There aren't many places in my home that don't have something gorgeous she made for my family. Each time I look at or use these treasured objects, I think of the legacy of caring that she consistently showed others. 
She didn't choose to dwell on her losses and difficulties. She embodied the French expression joie de vie, defined in English as an exuberant enjoyment of life. Her life was a continuing celebration of art, friendship, love, and funky dance music. <laughs> the dedication she showed these pursuits inspires me to seek out the joyful, the delightful, the kind, and the soulful. Her love of God and his creation, especially his people, reminds me to seek compassion and tolerance wherever it can be found or created. During her chemotherapy treatments, her postcard creation program to benefit those struggling to afford their co-pays made me think, well done, how very Robin. As a fellow mother of three, I remain in awe of the way Robin lost two of her three daughters, yet managed to keep her love for them foremost. She did not succumb to an overwhelming grief. She mourned their deaths in an absolutely admirable fashion, while not diminishing the depth of those losses. I'm still admiring how she opened up her heart and her studio to allow fellow grieving parents the chance to create and heal together. Robin used her talents to bolster others, living love as a verb in action. Her friendships were many, deep, and loyal. She grew and cultivated a precious garden of beloveds over decades and through multiple moves. Her attention to the relationships in her life comforts us now, even as we miss her here with us. We are here in this moment to honor the attention she paid us and to appreciate the kindness she shared with so many more people than could be here physically today. One of the sweetest relationships to celebrate is her gleeful one with my dad. Definitely a love story for the ages. She told me once that from the time they woke up, they laughed together much of the day. How glorious that she focused on humor, even in the midst of the pain of MS and rotten demonic cancer. May we all appreciate the ones we love with the enthusiasm Robin chose. I aspire to use my remaining days following Robin's leading by caring for fellow travelers. May we all continue to celebrate her life by treasuring our time with each other, by searching for whimsy and glee, by creating meaning with our gifts, and by getting down with our bad selves to every funky dance tune we hear. <laughs> Um, hello, I am Jane Holmes, and I am proud to be able to say I um, was a friend of Robin's from about 1996 on. She and I met when we were young mothers in Homewood, <clears throat> and our daughters, Becca Scout and Sarah Liz, were uh, in Ms. Versiglio's 5K class at Edgewood Elementary. And in Homewood, and they decided that there needed to be parent volunteers to open the milk cartons because little beginning five-year-olds took way too long to do that and made lunch very inefficient. So <clears throat> Robin and I happened to volunteer on the same day, and she had Georgia in tow, and she introduced me to Georgia, and I said, oh, Georgia, I love your name. My maiden name was George. And Robin's face lit up the way we all can imagine it lighting up. And she said, really, you're not from Lexington, South Carolina, are you? And I just about fell over because my family is from Lexington, South Carolina. And that was a connection of ours. Um, and so we became 
kind of bound at the hip and our children just became this rat pack. We, we ran around together the whole time. <laughs> we were in Homewood for that whole year and uh, we laughed. My friend, my daughter, Sarah and Georgia especially were soulmates and they refused to be apart. And so Robert and I would have to divvy up. You know, we take, I'd take Monday, Wednesday, Friday, she'd do Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And then on Sunday, both children hated us because we made them go to church with their separate families. And so, <laughs> but we ran around and uh, Robin and Donna Smith and I uh, met every morning and logged many a mile around Homewood before anybody was awake and solved all the world's problems, so we thought. Um, and, and that was a friendship that has lasted through the ages. We actually found out that when y'all lived in Columbia, South Carolina, you actually lived four blocks from where I lived. Yeah. And she attended the same elementary school I did but was one year behind me I think and and we were describing a teacher one day and and I said you know this teacher was so awful she was so strict and the only human thing she ever did all day was right after lunch and instinctively Robin made the symbol of opening a compact and putting on lipstick and I did the same thing at the same time and we went, Mrs. Hearn, you know. <laughs> so, so these were, you know, Robin, that was part of Robin's amazing self. Um, I credit her uh, with teaching me many things, and I'm honored and humbled to be here to help celebrate this life, because what a life, right? I mean, what a life. <laughs> The first, um, I, I, I credit her with teaching me many things, including dance moves. <laughs> I may not have mastered them, but, um, but I, I really credit her with teaching me two important lessons in life. The first lesson is that life is more about the journey than the destination. And um, she, she lived that. And it, it's important to keep your eyes and ears open as you travel your life's journey and pay attention to who you meet and what you can learn from them and how you can give back. I mean, Robin just exemplified that. Um, Robin never met a stranger, never. And you, even the guy at the DMV, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure she knew everything about him by the time she left. I remember really being fascinated um, at how she could tell me her mailman's whole life story. Um, <laughs> so much of the time, I don't pay attention to the little parts of my life. And so I encourage us all to enjoy the total journey and all that is available as we travel. The second lesson she taught me was how to connect the dots with people you meet. Um, find the common denominator and learn what they have to teach you and look for ways to give back. She shared her gifts in so many ways and we experienced a phenomenon in Columbia, South Carolina a few years ago called the Thousand Year Flood and it was devastating to the whole community. Robin started cookie cuttering out clay ornaments in the shape of South Carolina and creating them, decorating them, and sent me just boxes of them and wanted me to take them to all the families devastated by the flood just to give them encouragement and for them to know that their fa her faith community here in Alabama was praying for them. And that was the way she, that was her heart, that was the way she was. Um, she had more tragedy in her life than a lot of us have, and yet, her signature memory is her smile and her infectious laugh and giggle and dance moves. <laughs> her sunshines lit up the world on CBS Sunday morning like her smile lit up our world. She would want us all to keep shining our lights in a world that can often feel dim. <clears throat> Mitch Album 
wrote a book several years ago titled The Five People You Meet in Heaven. I've thought about that book a lot since Robin died and wondered who she met when she got to heaven. Because, I, of course, I know she's loving being with Greta and Georgia and her daddy. Um, but the book proposes that you meet significant people who changed your life or who inspired you along the way. And we know she spoiled some of that because she just went back and found Ted and married him, and he's still here. <laughs> But we know he would be one of those people. But I have wondered who that would be for her, um, because I know it will be her for me. She was definitely a life changer for me. Um, so in closing, I would like to share this poem with you that portrays Robin to me. <clears throat> be, don't be scared of how it starts. <laughs> Hurt people hurt others, but luckily, healed people heal others. Safe people shelter others. Free spirits free others. Enlightened people illuminate others. And love always wins. So shine your light of love on all who cross your path in life, even the DMV people, because what you do matters. Love you, Robin. Um, Theo's going to play a recording from Kim, who could not be here, and she had texted me earlier to say that she was felt terrible that she couldn't be here, but she wanted to share this, so uh, Theo's got that. Hello, this is Kim Margot Naylor coming to you all from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to travel from Oregon to be there today to celebrate Robin's life. But I want to begin by offering my heartfelt condolences to Ted, Sarah, Faith, their families, and all of Robin's dear friends, as well as a host of best friends that I'm sure have gathered there today. It is my great privilege and honor to speak about the life of my dearest friend, Robin Melinda Nance Metz, who has been a constant in my world since 1981 when we met when we were attending Auburn University. The year of 1981 and just less than two years starting in 2010 would be the only time Robin and I would actually ever live in the same town during our 40 plus years of friendship slash sisterhood. This detail was never calculated by me until now. And Robin and I spent lots of hours talking on the phone during all those years, visits several times a year, which certainly bridge that distance, but wanting to speak about the most profound thing about Robin would be, other than her joy, it would be her courage, her strength, and her resilience. And I wit when I think about I wit witnessing this and the likelihood of me even being able to do so, never even living near her, actually for less than 10% of that time, I even was driving distance from Robin. So I just want to mention a couple of things. In 1985, when Greta was born, I just happened to be visiting Robin from another state. And then 10 days later, Greta's funeral was just half hour from where I was living. When Georgia died at age 17, I had just moved to the Birmingham area a few months before. I am totally convinced God intended a purpose for me standing alongside Robin during those most difficult times. No doubt her example has influenced and inspired me when facing much less tragic challenges of my own. But Robin was not necessarily perfect, but I can tell you this, when it came to handling the unexpected slams that you could get right out of the blue in life, she was the bomb. Three times I watched her do this. This is when Robin is at the top of her game and stands the tallest. 
I mean a tower of strength, determined, composed when needed, with a firm hold on hope, and never abandoning her joy. Coming to terms with my responsibility to having had a front row seat to Robin's lived examples have, has made it crystal clear what I need to talk about today. I have no doubt Robin would agree as she was never seeking praise or attention when inviting others into her struggles. But Robin's hope was solely to help and encourage anyone she could by sharing her stories of love, loss, hope, healing. And she did all of this so beautifully when she was on this earth. So I'd like to share a couple of examples of Robin's journaling that she had posted publicly about 12 years ago, just before she and Ted got together uh, when she moved to Birmingham. The title of this post that Robin wrote is The Next 50 Years. I'm so excited about art that's in my head. It's almost time to let it out. A big part of me thinks art will be revealing to me, if not to anyone else. My teenage girls are my focus. I consider them as much a part of my art as any finished canvas I've been allowed to create. I love it all and cannot wait to see what God brings to light as the brush or pencil creates an image to contemplate. I want to be an artist, a real one, one with insight and focus to bring to the world's heart. Life is changing moment by moment and becoming a beautiful storm with wind, rain, lightning, and the heavy pressure that brings on good sleep. In one week, I'll start the second 50 years of my life. This has me so excited, I can't imagine what's coming over the horizon. Just the idea that I think I'm going to be 100 is exciting, though. I think I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to dance on a beautiful green hilltop in Ireland. One day, I'll have a house with a big room and a hard floor, great speakers, and a mirror ball hanging from the ceiling. I'm going to make people realize life is a great place to pass the time. I'm going to paint a house. I might write a book. I will continue to love people. I'll continue to be a mom. I love my life and all that it has to offer. I have big plans for the next 50 years. I hope you'll join me." End quote. Reading Robin's words made me realize a really good life cannot be measured by the number of years spent on this earth, but in the quality of those years and how you lived your life. And as Sarah wrote in Robin's obituary, Robin truly lived life. So let's take an inventory. I'm guessing Robin danced on a beautiful green hilltop when she and Ted were in Ireland, as well as danced in Japan and the many places those two loved birds traveled throughout this country as well. She got her house with the love of her life, complete with big rooms, hard floors, great speakers, a mirror ball hanging from a ceiling. <laughs> Luckily for us, we still get to see her dance on YouTube, which may not be a bad idea when needing to be motivated to find joy during a difficult time. She certainly helped Ted paint a house, and a first draft for her book is already laid out on her caring bridge with her journaling. Robin's hope for her next 50 years will realize, but just not in her projected time frame. Robin creating a tremendous amount of fantastic art while together with Ted is a glaring testimony to the benefits of love and support present in her life. Ted, Robin loved you dearly, and thank you so much for loving Robin as she became her very best and brightest when with you. Thank you, Sarah, for giving Robin the greatest gift you were capable of giving her. You did this when you summoned your love and a vast amount of courage, courage and parked yourself by your mother's side, giving her comfort and care during her final days and hours. She loved you so. The second post I would like to read that Robin wrote about 12 years ago, this one is titled Georgia Carolyn Rose, August 27, 1993 through, December, through November 27, 2010. This was five days after Georgia had passed away. Robin wrote, she was fantastic. I truly wish you could have met her. The high school held a service for her 
In Georgia, my life, in my life swirled together beautifully as people shared their Georgia stories from babyhood to this past Saturday. Her, her sister and I will survive this. I know for a fact my heart will heal as it has done before with the passing of her first sister at age 10 days, which was 26 years ago. God is good and generous. I feel like I've been granted a 17 year backstage pass to the greatest rock concert ever given. I saw the costume changes and heard the, mus and heard the musicians warming up. She was the star and I was her groupie. Robin, thank you for tolerating us groupies and sharing your joy. You taught us so much and it was the show of a lifetime. I love you. Um, I'm Shannon, and I really hate um, going after Kim made me cry <laughs> or listening to Sarah cry. But I met Robin and Daphne about 21 years ago, and interestingly, we met at school, and um, at a school party, I, I kind of liked her, and I said, do you, do you like to walk? And she said, yeah, I like to walk. And so, well, do you like to walk like a really, like, five miles walk? And she was like, duh. <laughs> and that is how we became friends. I think that anybody who wants to become really close to somebody, walk five miles every day with them because they will change your life. And she did change my life. Um, she taught me about grief. I, I, she lost her child, and I watched her um, with her first baby. She didn't really talk a lot about it. She had a really dark sense of humor and would throw something crazy out every once in a while that I didn't understand. <laughs> but she, when the time would come, she would say, hey, do you wanna go have a drink somewhere? And I'd go and we'd sit down and I would know things are not like every other day, but I wouldn't remember, I have the worst memory. And I was always so glad that she had a terrible memory because she never remembered my birthday and I didn't remember hers. <laughs> so I also did not remember Greta's exact days. So every year it was a surprise to me. I knew it was kind of time and I grew, I grew to know the signs, but we would go and sit and she would just tell me a little story here and there. Sometimes I heard the same story from the year before, but what I didn't know is that she was teaching me how to grieve in the future when I would lose my son. Um, anyway, that's pointless. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say how much she taught me. So I brought, um, brought some notes because I don't really prepare speeches at all. Um, so I, I wanted to talk about walking with her. We walked five miles in Daphne, but then we moved. And after I moved, we started walking on the phone. We would get up early in the morning sometimes and talk on the phone while we walked, and we called it walking together. Um, we did that when I moved. I still lived, I moved to Mobile, and she was in Daphne, and we would talk on the phone. And there was this woman there that, that area wasn't great where I walked. Um, and there was a woman that was probably mentally ill and maybe homeless. And she drove me crazy because I would be walking and she would come up and ask me for a dollar because she wanted a Fanta. And it just bugged the stew out of me. I hated it. And so I would say, oh my God, here comes that woman. She's coming in. And Robin said, Shannon, why don't you take a dollar with you? You have a lot of money. <laughs> take some money with you. And I was like, oh, okay. So, so the next time I went, I found out the lady's name is Ruby. You know? and so I would say, I would see Ruby and I would go, hey, Ruby. Oh, here, here comes Ruby. Hold on. Hey, Ruby, do you want a dollar to get a Fanta? Okay. Yeah. Okay, hold on. I'm getting Ruby the Fanta. And it changed my life and gave me joy to see Ruby because I was doing something good. I wasn't really, Robin was doing something good. Robin taught me. <laughs> so anyway. I was walking on the treadmill the other day, 
and thinking about the fact that I was going to be needing to get up here and say something. And I thought, Robin, what am I going to say? And um, I started thinking about the fact that when she was sick, when she wasn't sick, she would send me songs. Um, it just meant time to dance or, you know, whatever. But when, after she became sick, sometimes I, I, I learned that it meant she's not feeling great and she, she needed to feel better. So we would trade, um, trade dance videos, which, have you seen those? <laughs> <laughs> We've seen the ones on YouTube, but the ones that I did for her are humiliating. <laughs> <laughs> So she would send me a video, and then I would send her a video, and we would laugh about it, and then I'd say she posted one on, um, on YouTube. You should all look those up. Um, she would, one of the things, she would also introduce me to new music she liked, so John Batiste, I think that's, um, she introduced me to him. You all need to look up the song Freedom. It's awesome. But while I was thinking, Robin, what do you want me to say? This is what I thought she wanted me to say. So. Um, I've asked my sister to come help me, my sister Brooke, <laughs> because I am not a singer and I have never sung in front of anybody, so, <laughs> but my sister has. <laughs> so, um, I really felt like, like Robin told me to sing this song, so I think the lyrics will speak for themselves. Ready? On the verge of crying I don't feel like trying But instead I'll sing, yeah Oh, instead I'll sing When I'm done with worry and no one's around me. Don't you know I sing, yeah. Oh, I love to sing. When I can't find the words and everything starts to hurt, I'm done with this heavy heart. I let all my burdens off and I sing. And so uninspired, don't, don't you know I'll sing, yeah, oh, I'll dance and sing. <laughs> when I'm down. When I'm down and I feel like giving up, Ooh. <laughs> even the easy things feel rough. Don't you know I'll sing, yeah, oh, I'll dance and sing. When I feel down and out or under a heavy cloud, when I don't want to talk, I let all my burdens off and I sing. Ooh, 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 sing. That's a celebration. Um, Doug? Hi. My name's Doug. I met uh, Robin through some cancer treatments that I went through at the same time she was going through it. And one thing that's helped me through all this is that I believe that no one is truly gone as long as they still are in your heart and mind. So every day I have a reminder from Robin through her examples about how to live, how to go through life. And so I just want to 
give you the top five that I go through every day. Um, first one is relationships through Robin. I met Ted, I met Shannon, I met their friends, their family, etc. That has an impact on me every day. Everyone I talk to that's been associated with Robin, just like going through today, gives me inspiration on a daily basis. The second is art. Every, almost every room in my house has some form of art from Robin. It's always very colorful, it's always very fun, and it gives me joy and comfort every time I see it. So another place where every day I see something that's about Robin. Third thing is strength. She gave me a completely new perspective. When I went into my cancer treatments, I thought it was absolutely horrible. First day I sat down, lucky enough to sit down next to Robin. Some of you have heard the story. She told me about her life with this big smile on her face. And I thought, why? It's not that bad for me. Look at what this woman is doing. So it gave me a new perspective on how to be strong. And again, that affects me every day in my life. Fourth thing is, is how to live life. And I can't say enough about this, the fact that she, I think, beat cancer through the way she lived her life. She lived more life. I only knew her 18, 18 months, um, and she lived more in that 18 months that I got to experience than most people live over years. And it gave me a perspective, made me understand how to live life and how important that was. Number five is kindness. Um, and a quick story here. So the second time I went to chemo, I walk into the lobby, and Robin's sitting there waiting for me to come in. And this woman has pancreatic cancer. She isn't too, doing too well, but she takes the time to wait for me just to give me a piece of candy and tell me to have a good day. And that made such, I still have the wrapper on my refrigerator, and it reminds me every single day. I think the key thing is to be kind, to celebrate life, to be joyful. And that was a lesson that she taught me. So. Physically, she's gone, but in my heart, in my mind, in all our hearts and minds, I think she's part of our lives every day, and she'll continue to be. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. I assume I'm last because I have no time limit. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, my name's Brian Adler. I had the privilege of being the oncologist on Robin's medical team. It includes some exceptional nurses who developed great bonds with Robin and really made a huge difference. I know Ted wanted me to tell you about how she's helped our foundation, and I'll get to that in a moment and hopefully not take that long. Um, but I think we have to put it in a little context. When I first met Robin, she had gone through an extensive surgery because the cancer had advanced far enough that there were some critical things that had to be corrected or she was going to die in days. I'll be honest, when I saw her, I thought, did we do, I wasn't, I hadn't seen her yet, but did the surgeon do the right thing by putting her through this extensive surgery? I, I just was kind of stunned. And then Robin stunned me more. Um, she got better, sure, I thought, yeah, she might get out of the hospital. She got out of the hospital. She showed back up in the clinic. She was ready for chemotherapy. I wasn't sure I was, but she was. So I said, okay, let's, let's see how you do. We started on some chemotherapy, she got better. And I said, okay, now let's go to the heavy guns. She got better, she kept getting better. When I first met her, I, didn't, I had no idea that she would do as well as she did, albeit far less than anybody would have wanted. And the whole time, when I would, she'd come in, we'd have a visit before the chemotherapy, see how things go, and I'd ask those interesting questions like, any nausea, any vomiting, how are the bowel movements? <laughs> we'd get through that, and then we would talk usually a little bit. And what always came out was how fortunate she was to have the husband she had, to have the daughter she had, to have the family she had, and to have the friends she had. 
And, and I don't have any doubt, as much as everybody prospered from the relationship that you had with her, she knew how to make that help her too. She was stronger for those relationships that she developed. And it was incredibly meaningful. If you ask me why did she do so well, it's because of you. The chemotherapy, yeah, that helped some, but I really think her drive was her love of life, which was the relationships that she had forged. But, you know, so we're going through, and then she comes in one day and says to me, I want to contribute to some money to people who have trouble paying their bills. All right, um, okay. Uh, a few months ago, you were kind of almost dead. <laughs> but now we're wondering what we can do for these other people. That's great. Um, just so happened that my group had created a foundation to do just that. And she was one of the first people to put something together to get money into it. Um, and you know, then she comes in another time with the postcards. And she gives me three of them, says, this is what I'm doing, I'm gonna sell these and make money and I want you to have these three. You can send them to people, and I don't wanna send them to people. I look at her, <laughs> I'm gonna frame these. <laughs> And she said, oh, really? I have a bunch more. <laughs> okay, yeah, let me give you those. So she gave us 18 of the postcards. And one of the things that makes me happiest is we did frame them. We put them up. One of the nurses, Kim Nolly, knew how to put them up and didn't let me do it. <laughs> um, and we have a wall that basically is her art. It's that joyful art. I don't want to tell you what we got rid of. <laughs> the nicest thing I can say about the things we got rid of is they were sofa size. Um, <laughs> but we have this wall that looks like a wall of joy in the middle of this oncology clinic now. And I can't tell you how many patients have come in and said, where'd you get that? That's great. And her impact will go on, as you can imagine, for years, not just because of the contributions that she gave to the foundation, but now we have a wall of her art that will bring her spirit forward for decades. So I thank her very much and thank you for the opportunity to just tell you something about my side of, her, of Robin. Thank you. So I'm the lucky one I get to stand up here and I get to tell another story I thought of. So back around 1995, somewhere around there, um, uh, my sister Jenny was living in this house that had this huge living room wall and they had this big sofa behind it. And she asked Robin to paint her a sofa painting, which was very popular at the time at furniture stores. You'd see these split paintings, you know, the landscape that split into three pieces. It's a very fashionable thing. People had them all the time. So Robin painted everybody sofa paintings. They were big paintings of sofas. <laughs> so... With, with this story in mind, I'm turning over to the floor if anybody would like to share any stories of Robin that you would like to share with us so that we can enjoy what you enjoyed. Anybody? I have one, if I can stay seated. Uh, you stay seated. <laughs> I don't like speaking in groups. Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank the Academy <laughs> <laughs> and the director for taking a chance on me. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, one story was when we were at Montevallo. I met Robin in January of 1979, and we remained best friends ever since. Um, I was up in the painting studio at Montevallo, painting very late. I think it was 2 in the morning and I heard some kind of something going on behind me, sound like it was coming from the doorway. 
And so I turned around slowly, didn't know what I'd see, and there stood Robin and my roommate, completely naked. <laughs> <laughs> Not a stitch between them. And they just were giggling. <laughs> and I said, how did you get here? And they said, we ran across from the dorm. <laughs> Across the street, up the sidewalk, up three more flights to the painting studio. And then they just said, okay, we came by to say hi, so bye. <laughs> <laughs> and another story I have had, Robin came running up to me one day, laughing hysterically, bent over, trying to get words out. And I'm like, what is so funny? She finally got out. I just bit Ted Metz on the butt. <laughs> and I said, you what? She said, I just bit Ted Metz on the butt. I don't know what came over me. I walked by the room. I saw him standing there. And I ran and bit him on the butt and ran out. <laughs> design class and she was in that class I don't know if she's a student or not <laughs> she was a student at the university but I can't really recall if she was my student and I'm lecturing and this person comes up and really bites me on the butt <laughs> so, you know everyone hears the stories about you know oh yeah student professor all that kind of stuff and their eyes raised well she was my student, and after that experience, I was really afraid of Rob. <laughs> I would not get on an elevator with her. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> and then she went her way and had her life, and a lot of the sadness that's been expressed here. And then 31 late years later, we had lunch together. <laughs> I would like to go. I'm Gabrielle Metz. I'm Ted's youngest daughter. Theo is the youngest child. Um, so in 1980, I had a best friend named Robin, Met Robin Mance. And um, she was my best friend. She, besides biting dad on the ass, which is what she told us. Sorry, I said that in a church. But she told us she hid under the desk and bit him. And imagine we were all like, okay, this is really a crazy story. I can't believe you're telling this as our new um, Mobbin. <laughs> she wanted to be called our Mobbin. So at any rate, I was thinking about what I wanted to say to pay tribute to this amazing light in all of our lives. And they say people come into your life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. The reason she's been in our life the last 13, 14 years are too numerous to speak of. You all have stories. She taught us how to live. She taught some of us how to die. She taught us how to be present and look at the flowers and the light and the light in the world and to see so very much. Live life on your own terms with full abandon that's the reason. The season was this amazing time she got to be my mom. They never were together back then. There was never any impropriety. <laughs> I promise you, she would have told us. <laughs> oh yeah, we heard how much she loved dad. She loved him 
fiercely, devotedly, <coughs> amazingly. The lifetime came when I was five. I met Robin in a time when our family was struggling and she noticed and she took the time as a 20 year old kid herself to be with a five year old kid and a 17 year old kid and a 12 year old kid and take us to the college pool and spend time with us, loving us and help our family when we needed it most. And I'll never forget her for that. Fast forward 30 years later, I'm fortunate enough to be going to Japan with my dad. I paid my own way. I worked, uh, I worked at Sloss Wright Furnace for one year and it paid for my flight to go and it was amazing. He was installing sculptures with his students and I got to go with them. I look over on the plane and my dad has a laptop. We're talking 15 years ago. Do you know Ted Metz? He is not a businessman. <laughs> and I'm like, why does he have a computer on the plane? And he said, do you remember Robin Nance? I never forgot her, is what I said. She made a lifetime difference. She loved my mom. She tried to help her. She was such a giving, amazing soul that if I never saw her again one day in my life, she would have made a lifetime difference to me. Fast forward some days, months, in the last couple years, and we're having a conversation. And I'm curious what she thinks of the kid me and the 20-year-old the her and the five-year-old me. And she's telling me a story about how she loved my dad fiercely and devotedly and intensely since 1980, since meeting him and probably camping out in his class and not even being enrolled. <laughs> and she told me, my friend and I were sitting on the dock of the bay and we spent all night out there. And right before my friends went to sleep, she mentioned Ted Metz was getting divorced. And then she fell asleep, and I stayed up all night going, what, Ted Metz is divorced? <laughs> and she said, she finally woke up, and she said, oh, you know Ted? And she said, yes, his daughter was my best friend when I was in college. <laughs> and right there, I knew that the feelings were mutual. Fast forward, one of the last days of her life, Shannon was so givingly coming over to massage her feet. And Robin told me the story that I had not heard before. She said, remember you would spend the night with me at Flower Hill? I said, yeah. So Robin, in exchange for um, drawing drawings of all the architectural buildings, which are in the exhibit, which I hope you will see because it's full of joy and so many amazing chapters of her artistic career, um, she got to live at Flower Hill in like the servants' quarters, if you will. <laughs> so she said, remember how the two twin beds? And I said, yeah. She said, well, I woke up one day and there was this little you curled up, cuddled next to me. She said, at that moment, I realized that I wanted to be a mom. And she said, tell Shannon when she comes over. And I didn't get a chance to do that because of the way things went. But I think she wanted that story told because when she came into our life for this season and this reason, her Facebook said, lead mother at mother. <laughs> I don't think she was any more proud than having Greta and Sarah and Georgia, and the four of us. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for letting me share that Robin was a reason, a season, but always a lifetime for me. When Robin was at Auburn, she was given a um, uh, an assignment to go and paint something of significance from the university. 
And so I have that watercolor at my house. She went outside of Biggin Hall, if you're familiar with uh, the campus at Auburn, the, um, probably the ugliest building on campus is Biggin Hall. And of course it was designed by art and architecture. But they would, she came out of that building every day and she would sit on this bench facing Toomer's Corner. And it's the freshman gate. It's the big brick gate. There are 10,000 portraits of that gate all over the world because everybody saw that gate when they came to Auburn. She painted the back of it. <laughs> so on my wall is this brick painting, I mean this painting in watercolor of this brick thing with the butts of two eagles facing you as you're looking at it. <laughs> Anybody else have anything they'd like to share about Robin? Thank <laughs> you. 
finest people I've ever known in my life. She was the finest person I've ever known in my life. And, uh, but I never matched that. And I love her.
We loved like sisters. We fought like sisters. You bossed there me were, around like sisters. We bossed <laughs> you around like sisters. Rick and I bossed you and Robin around yeah, like, yeah. like sisters. Um, we shared the love of dance and dressing up. And every time we got together, we had to do that. We, we would watch American Band stand and put on our go-go boots and we would dance. Um, I have the pictures to prove that even as adults, we were still dressing up and dancing. Um, I remember us going to dance clubs and dancing. Um, when I, grandmother. Yeah, we dressed our grandmother up too. <laughs> and um, when I was a teenager and um, was going through a particularly troubled time and I moved in with you guys. And Robin took me under her wing, which was hard to do because I was a lot taller than her. But she introduced me to all her friends and made me feel at home. And we shared other things. We were pregnant with our first babies at the same time. My Kate was born 10 days before Greta. And every time she sees Kate, she says, that's how Greta would be. We were diagnosed with autoimmune diseases in the same year. We had some difficult marriages. Um, so I always just felt this bond with Robin. And she could come in and light up a room. You know, no matter how bad things were, they were okay when Robin was around. And I lost my brother to cancer four years ago. I'm the oldest, he was the second, just like in this family. And I like to think that Mark and Robin or dancing together. Anybody else have anything to share? I, I have to say something now that she okay, says it. Okay. <laughs> but, um, the favorite, the favorite cousin. Yes, Go ahead. I am really the favorite cousin. We were soul sisters. A lot of things that happened, Robin happened to me. But the best thing. I can say about Robin is when she was really sick, she gave me two of her friends who I did not know. She gave me them. They, they lived not too far from me. It's a little ways, but not too far. And she was watching out for other people. And she wanted me to become good friends with them. And I, I actually have talked to them on the phone, done a couple things with them. And it's been really nice because they love Robin too. And it's, it's nice to be able to talk. But that's the kind of person that Robin was. She worried and cared about everyone. That's it. Thank <laughs> you. 
I have to tell a dance story. <laughs> Some of us are of a certain age and may remember a concert series that would travel around called um, Parliament Funkadelic. Does anybody remember Parliament Funkadelic? So Parliament Funkadelic was at the BJCC and Robin took a guy from my class, Kevin Thomas, to go down there because Kevin loved to dance also. And Kevin was a thalidomide baby. He had an arm that was this long, had three fingers on it. And Kevin and Robin walked into the BJCC, which was primarily not white people <laughs> for the Parliament Funkadelic concert. And Kevin told the joke to Robin, everybody's gonna look at us. And about half the people in the group that, were, that they walked into the door on turned around to look at them because they didn't fit. One of these things is not like the other. And Kevin went. <laughs> and they all turned around and everybody started dancing. So, <laughs> so has anybody got anything else? I did want to add one more thing. Ted, okay. I heard about you when I was 20 years old. <laughs> that could be in some Ted. I saw him in some westerns. That's all. <laughs> Let's dance. Speaking of. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to share? Yeah. Right. Well, I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, Sam? Oh, there you are. Um, I, I'd encourage, Sam's going to give us some closing remarks, but I'd encourage everyone to please, uh, well, you may want to stand outside or stand in the hallway because it's a little warm in here, but please stay and talk because that's what Robin would want. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm pastor at Montevallo Presbyterian Church, Ted and Robin's church, and that's Part of why I'm here, I thought it was because I was her best friend. <laughs> you were. But then I started putting things together and figured, you all are, we all are her best friend. And just going to sit and talk with her, how she would give her undivided attention to you, like you were the most special person in the world. You think you're her best friend, but she does that to everyone, so... Listen, I want to read a very short poem. It's one of my favorite poems, and the spirit of it to me is like the spirit of Robin. Uh, so if you bear with me, I'm going to read this poem. I'm going to give a short blessing. We're going to have some music, and we're going to move. Okay? All right? You're, yes, we're going to move. This is a poem called God Says Yes to Me. Kayleen Hart. I asked God if it was okay to be melodramatic, and she said, yes. I asked her if it was okay to be short, and she said, it sure is. I asked her if I could wear nail polish or not wear nail polish, and she said, honey, she sometimes calls me that. She said, you can do just exactly what you want to. Thanks, God, I said. And is it even okay if I don't paragraph my letters? Sweet cakes, God said. Who knows where she picked that up? What I'm telling you is yes, yes, yes. I invite you to stand for a closing. We go in peace, remembering that just as Robin said yes to us, God says yes to us and to each and every person. Just as she loved us, God loves you too and loves, loved us through her. Just as she would want us to celebrate with joy not only her life, but life itself, we say yes, 
Yes, yes. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. Let's, God says it's okay to dance. Okay?